Okay, so let us begin the word, with a word of prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we again give thanks for your love and mercy towards us and for rescuing us from the slavery to sin. Help us to live holy and pure before you in righteousness. We ask for a garment of salvation that you've made available to us to be clothing us. Forgive us for our sins and may this meeting be to your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So this is the, uh, the fifth presentation that I am presenting concerning a Bible-based chronological study with a focus on the book of Judges. I have talked uh, touched on Judges uh, some points. Um, I just gave it initially an overview of how things are developing in chronology terms. Uh, particularly in Millerite history was a, a, a spike in the sense if you're going to have like a graph where God is revealing a lot of chronological information. Since that day or time you had our higher medicine maybe mention a few things, and then we've had some male and white statements, but generally since then, um, there hasn't been much development in terms of chronology until we, we get until about 2005, whether 25, 20s, are both seen um, in Jeff Peppinger's movement. Uh, and then with uh, Dwayne Dewey as well. And then really since 2014, uh, or 2013 even, around that time period, Ezra 7-9 opened up, and there's just been an increasing understanding of chronology since that, ter and, and since that time. And uh, that led to July 18, 2020 prediction. And even after that, a lot of these here things, these here uh, date and span correlations that I will be sharing in this presentation has really, most of them have really been opened up uh, since July 18. So God is still very much uh, revealing a lot of chronological information. Uh, the last meeting we discussed the ceasing of the manna. And uh, we seen there, there was a, a period of 40 years which um, we related it as 14,587 days, or 14,000 plus 187, or 14,400 plus 187. And um, through that there chronology, we've seen that from the time of Glacier View, uh, when that there was occurring on August 11th, uh, 1980. You can count that similar span until July 18. And there was, in the Glacier View, they were discussing about Antiochus Epiphanes. And that was Desmond Ford. And he was proposing that that there was the fulfillment of the 2300 uh, evening and morning prophecy. And uh, that involved cutting that 2300 days uh, into to making it 11,100, sorry, 11, sorry, 1,150 days. And then with that ceasing of a man of, if you add that onto it, it takes you to July 18, uh, that period of time from when the manna began to fall until it ceased, it takes you to July 18 from that there time of glacier view. And seen there, there was that there, July 18, you can sort of put that in the middle of a 2,300 day period. Uh, connect it with 9-11 uh, at the end of that, this, the, this, this year, coming year. And then prior to that, it takes you to the 25th of May, uh, 2017, where there was a commemoration of 9-11 and the fall of the Berlin Wall, two significant way marks that Jeff Peppinger uh, identified and uh, what the Bible indeed identifies with the spirit of prophecy. 
So with this presentation, I'm going to begin with looking at the 300 years of the Ark at Shiloh. This is uh, an Ellen White quote. And then I'm going to trace back uh, to creation from the time of Abraham, from when he left Haran. And then I'm going to look at further evidence for 1533 BC and for the date as the date for the Exodus. So the 300 years of the Ark at Shiloh, I had already mentioned this here quote. i uh, just say it again. So Ellen White says, The Ark remained at Shiloh for 300 years until, because of the sins of Eli's house, it fell into the hands of the Philistines, and Shiloh was ruined. The Ark was never returned to the tabernacle here. The sanctuary service was trans finally transferred to the temple at Jerusalem and Shiloh fell into insignificance. So taking these 300 years as exact, they would begin seven years after the 300 years of Judges 1126, after they had begun, and that would make Eli a contemporary with uh, Jephthah. So I have here a diagram uh, comparing these here two periods of 300 years. So the dwelling of Heshbon begins the 300 years related in Judges 11.26. And I've put that there to the date 1494 BC. I believe it was late in that year, so maybe about four or five months before they actually crossed the, the Jordan and entered into Canaan. And it ends when Jephthah defeats the Ammonites. The year that occurs, it's uh, 11,094 BC. Sorry, 1,194 BC. And I've said there, I'm identifying just one year. There, I know it's only maybe about five months, maybe but I'm still putting it one year as in it's in the other Gregorian year. And um, that takes you to the crossing of Jordan. And then we've already identified six years taking the land um, until there was rest from war. And then the land is divided by lot. And the tabernacle is set up in Shiloh in 1487 BC. And this is, begins this year 300 years that Ellen White identifies as the Ark in Shiloh. And then that would end when Eli dies. And that's in 1187 so, uh, yeah, BC. And similar to the beginning, like in, in a Mur section, we have Jephthah rule judging six years, which parallels the six years of the taking of the land. And then there's a one-year period from Jephthah to when the Ark is removed from Shiloh. This is just taking the, the chronological information that we're given. I'm not saying, well, Ellen White could be rounding off her 300 years. We don't have that knowledge, but I'm just saying this is what we're giving. And we can at least create these here structures or see them, uh, even if the, the time itself may have actually been slightly different. There's another structure I've seen with these here 300 years. So I have this here. This is the period where the tabernacle is set up. And it was six years after the Israelites entered in their Canaan. However, that was uh, 300 years prior to that date will take us to the birth of Joseph in 1787 BC. And after he was born, he remained in Haran uh, with his father and Jacob and his family until they removed to Canaan. And they were there. Uh, so you have six years on one side of that there, 300 year period, and then six years at the end of it being marked. And there's, I just note, there's a there that we get this information from. It's from Genesis 31, verse 38. It says, Jacob, speaking to Laban, said, This twenty years have I been with thee, thy ewes and thy goats, 
have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. So this year, 20 years can be divided up into 14 years, uh, so well, I'll say seven years first, where Jacob serves Laban for the, for the marriage of Leah, and then there's seven years he works again for Rachel, so a total of 14 years, which leaves a period of six years to make up these here uh, 20 years that we find in Genesis 31, verse 38. And then, I'm just marking here, the end of that chiasm, or this year's structure, I'm marking these here seven years of Rachel, which will be reflected uh, at the end here in seven months. So this year, 300 year period, I'm going to just, it's getting a wee bit messy. I'm just going to, uh, I can't delete them, it's all right. So we have 300 years here, and then the 300 then years of the arc in Shiloh, that arc's going to be removed. And then we have a period of seven months that's brought to view in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. It says, the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And that parallels these here seven years of uh, where Jacob serves Laban for Rachel. And another structure identified, we again here have this year 300 year period with the ark in Shiloh. It's then going to be 210 years to when the kingdom is divided until the captivity of Manasseh in 677 BC, which is another period of 300 years. So these here 210 years are, can be seen in like a, a micro form with 210 days, which we, which is the number we, we get if we think of prophetic months, so there's 30, month, uh, 30 days in a month, and the ark is in Philistia for seven months, so we have that 210 there as well. And then we have that number 210, and in a sense, the same numbers, we have 210, so we have a 2 and a 1 and a 0, and then counting back from the kingdom being divided, we have 120 years of the kings of the United Kingdom, so Saul, David, and Solomon. So that's 120. And if you were to multiply 210 by 120, it gives you 25,200. So just a 2520 times 10. And then we can identify that in 677 BC, William Miller is going to calculate 2520 years. And that will take you to 1844. And I've identified here on the 15th of August in the Gregorian day where we have the midnight cry on the first day of the fifth month. And counting back from when the ark began at Shiloh, we can go back to the year 1494 BC. That's when Aaron dies, also on the, fifth day of the fifth, first day of the fifth month. And that's brought to view in Numbers chapter 33, and I think it's like verse 39. And then in the Gregorian date, this is also the 15th of August. So there we've there we have the exact same date in the biblical calendar and the Gregorian calendar at either, same, either end of this structure. So that would have been around, um, so I'm just saying here, we're not, we don't know exactly when the ark was situated in Shiloh, but we know that it was about seven years uh, since Aaron died. And so I'm just writing in there 25, 20 days as a, um, Approximate. I'm not too sure whether it's exact or not. We don't have that information. But I just think it's just uh, an interesting structure that we can form when we get this here chronology uh, correct. Uh, we've already identified uh, when Jacob and Joseph are rejoined. They, that occurs in, in 1748. This is midway in the period of the 430 years that we read about in uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. And um, I think it's there, isn't it? It's, 400. It's, it's, it's about there anyway. I could be getting up mixed up with the 400. No, that's, that's um, 
the center of the 430 years. So that's yeah. the center of the chiasm mm -hmm. of the 430. The butler and the baker is the center of the chiasm mm -hmm. of Joseph. Yes. So they're staggered by 11 years. Yes. So we can calculate from that their time. There was two years of famine, seven years of plenty. So that was nine years. And then this is when Joseph begins his time as uh, second in command in Egypt. And that would be 39 years. And so that would identify 1787 BC uh, for the birth of Joseph. So I'm just sort of identifying that there, that, uh, that their chronology, where that comes from, how we identify that. And um, there's another structure that we can find that connects with uh, the division of the kingdom. Uh, after Solomon died, to Artaxerxes' degree, we can identify there the 39 years of Joseph's life. Now, the division of the kingdom lines up with the birth of Joseph. And... That was in 977 BC when the kingdom divided. And Ezekiel had already identified 390 years until the siege of Jerusalem. So this here lines up with 39 years of Joseph's life. So in this year's structure, we're seeing Joseph's life, the years of his life being increased by the power of 10. But the, the structure is very similar. Now this reminds me of um, in the story of Joseph, there's the, and, and Jacob, there's the four periods of seven years, uh, two of them being 140 together, right? So, mm -hmm. and then there is um, uh, the 22 years. And we have, the, uh, so we have that in uh, the four, seven times. There ends up being mm -hmm. four periods of 70 years, two periods that can be, uh, one is from Jehoiachin's captivity to 457 is 140 years. And then the mm -hmm. first two seven times are two periods of seven years tied together. So you have the same thing. It's, it's in, in this case, uh, you know, it's going to be 10 times as well. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of related to that, but this is a different mm -hmm. structure, which is kind of interesting. Yes. So I can maybe refer back to what you're saying and, and just sort of showing a diagram just what uh, Theodore is talking about. Uh, but in, in this here case, I'm just lining up these here 30, 390 years of Ezekiel with the 39 years of Joseph's life. And we can also identify the 30 years when Joseph was made prime minister with the 300 years from the dividing of the kingdom to when Manasseh was taken captive. And then the first seven times applies to a period of 70 years, it applies when to the power, the pride of your power shall be broken. And the pride of their power, of the Israelites, uh, was their king. And he was taken captive in 677 BC. And that began a period of 70 years until the second se uh, period of, of 70 years, which connects with the next seven times, it says, they shall rob the kingdom of Wild beasts shall rob your children. So wild beasts we, is a reference uh, to Daniel chapter 7, where we have these kingdoms like a lion, such as Babylon, and the bear, as Medo Persia and so forth. So it represents the kingdom. So in this case, it is the lion, it is Babylon, that will come in and rob the Israelites of their children, in particular Daniel and his three companions. So that's referring to the second seven times. And that 70 year period then relates to the seven years of plenty. And then the seven years of famine begins. And this is divided up into two years when Jacob and Joseph join. And then five years to when the famine ends. And we also have within that 70 year period of the captivity, a period where there's 20 years until the siege of Jerusalem begins, and then thereafter, there's going to be a period of 50 years to end that 70 years ends, and Cyrus is going to be enthroned. And there's an Ellen White coach, she says that these 70, year, 70 years ended in the autumn. I think she, well, she says 
yeah. within two years yeah. of his death. Of Darius. Yeah, it's kind of interesting on this point because I was reading um, uh, a scholarly paper where he deals with uh, Darius the Mede and Cyrus, and he uses exactly the same term that Ellen White uses within two years mm -hmm. of the taking of Babylon. We have the death of Darius the Mede, and Cyrus then ascends to the throne. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, something that's been recognized by others who accept uh, the Bible chronology. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And so that's paralleling the seven years of famine. And we note this, noted that uh, Jacob, when he joins Joseph, he's uh, 130 years old. That's what he says to Pharaoh. And 130 years later, from when Jerusalem is besieged, besieged uh, we can identify Artaxerxes' decree in 457 BC. And uh, we had previously mentioned, I think, uh, I think it was in Iran's presentation, <coughs> uh, one this year number here, uh, 25, 252 times 7, which is 1,764 years. And uh, Theodore had noted that uh, Israel blesses his 12 sons in 1731 BC. And then that's the, the structure here is from Joseph's life. He's uh, 17 years old when he's taken into captivity in Egypt. Then there's 11 years to when he gives, interprets the dream of the butlers and beggar. And then there's going to be 11 years to when he meets his father again. Uh, two years in, within the seven years of famine. And then Jacob's going to live a further 17 years until he dies, aged 147. And if you multiply 147 by 12, we get this here number 1764 as well. And so from that there period, 1764 years, this will take us to 34 AD, and then we can identify another period of 1,764 years until the time of the end. And the, I've said here, applying it to spiritual Israel, in the sense you had literal Israel uh, prior to that. And I um, suppose after, first the natural, then the spiritual was one of what Paul was talking about. So in a sense, you could maybe apply the Christian church to be in spiritual Israel, although it didn't really enter into any specific um, covenant. Other, well, you can maybe identify the two wave loaves at Pentecost as that covenant. I think Jeff made that application. But it's really when you get to uh, the two charts in the Seventh day Adventist church where you have something that parallels also the uh, Ten Commandments. So I would say the spiritual Israel today would be the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I had discussed previously, it just is kind of like just a review. Um, I'm going back to this here number here, 1933 BC. And this is when Isaac was mocked by Ishmael. Ishmael is the father of Islam, as well as Abraham. And there's a period of 400 years that ends in the Exodus of 1533 BC. And these here dates connect with spans. So from the restraint of Islam, in the 11th of August, 1840, we had identified a period of 1,533 days, which connects with this year date. That ends with the beginning of the investigative judgment. And then it's also a period of 1,933 months, uh, which connects with this year date. And that takes us to 9-11. And I'm sort of uh, lunar months, or are they? I think it's just standard Gregorian months. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and just sort of that there sort of takes us back to this here time period where Abraham, these here prophecies of 430 years and 400 
years begin. So that was uh, the 430 years begins when uh, Abraham leaves Haran. And um, we want to look back, which I'm going to try to work back from then. So that was uh, 1963 BC. is when Abraham is 75 years old, and then prophecies of the, prof well, the prophecy of 430 years is going to be projected. From then, it takes us to 1533. And if you go to Genesis chapter 11, uh, we can then count back from 1933 BC, and we can uh, total a period of 427 years uh, through the ages of the patriarchs that were then revealed. So it talks about the flood and Shem having um, a son, well, begetting a son, or Faxad, two years after the flood. So that's that two years there being noted. And so our Faxad is born then. So that would make Shem uh, 100 two years after the flood, and so Shem would be 98 years when the flood actually occurred. Or Faxad, he's going to be 35 years old when Salah is born. And so you can add that 35 with them two years, it gives us 37 years and so forth. And we can keep on going on until we get to when Terah. He's going to be 130 years old when Abraham is born. And... Um, we add that um, I think it's yeah, 130 years is so previous to that uh, Terra was the, the, the total added up was 222 so with them 130 years it takes us to 352 and then we add the 75 years where, of the age of Abraham to when he leaves Haran so Genesis 11 26 tells us that Terah lived 70 years and begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. So this implies that either Nahor or Haran were born when he was 70 years old rather than Abraham or Abram, as the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. So uh, that's what we read there in Genesis 11. So thereafter, Abraham, Abram leaves Haran at age 75 years old. So the math there being 205 minus 75 equals 130 years for the age of Terah when Abram was born. So this year chronology agrees with what Usher has. Uh, he, so he's understood that this is a period from the flood to when Abraham leaves Haran at 427. Miller had the number 428. I don't know where he got that number from, but he maybe made a mistake somewhere. Um, also, I can imply from that, but I, I tend to agree with, uh, with Usher. And uh, just noting, with uh, Shem, these here 98 years, also identified that Eli was 98 years old when he died. It talks about that in 1 Samuel. And I've kind of lined these here two up. So the door of the ark was shut uh, when at the end of that period of 98 years, and Noah, he's, he was 600 years old, or 300, I put it here as 300 times 2. And Eli, you had the ark also being mentioned, although this here is the, the ark of the covenant. And the ark was at Shiloh three, for 300 years, or we can identify 300 times 2 since the birth of Joseph. And then it's going to be seven days until the flood when it's recorded that all flesh died in Genesis 7 verse 21. And this is paralleling the seven months where the ark is with the Philistines. And when the ark is returned, it's recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 6 verse 19 that the people of Beth Shemesh look into the ark and talks about a great slaughter occurring. So that would line up with the, 
the amount of deaths that occur at the, uh, the flood. And here I have this year period sort of set off forth on a line as a structure with 98 years on this side and 98 years on that side. And the period in between is 1,301 years. And uh, it was uh, sort of, when I'd done this here, I didn't really think much of it. But uh, then Theodore, he made the calculation that from the first day of the first month in 1533 BC, so that would be the beginning of months that we find about, we read about in, in Exodus, I think chapter 12 or, or not their time. Uh, then it's going to be, from that there time, it's going to be 1300. Oh, where did I go? 1301 to 1,000, okay, so until the date that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Theodore had identified, the first day of the first month, in uh, 2030, which he had identified as the 5th of April. So just identifying out their number sort of maybe uh, sort of give a bit more meaning to the number that we find here with the 298 year periods. And then uh, we can then calculate the year of the flood, we just add 427 to 1933 BC. And then we can therefore identify the year when the flood occurred, and that was 2390 BC. And then it's been understood that the period from creation to the flood was 1656 years in duration. These years added to 2390 BC implies that the year 40, 400, sorry, 4046 BC was the year of creation. And that's that identified there. And we had also identified this is the same timeline, but in here I've added the year 1933 BC when Isaac is mocked and the 400 years going to the Exodus as well as the 430 years going to the Exodus. And that there, I'm adding that because we can identify some structures uh, beginning from, from this here sort of timeline that we have here. There's a lot of structures come into play and I'm just going to stop sharing and uh, just show you some of them. Oh. So I'm just going to put in here 977 BC for the division of the kingdom. We have a period of 36 years to when we have a period then of 480 years. This is the fourth year of Solomon and the temple is going to be begun to be built. Construction then begins. And there's going to be a period of 480 years to when the, the land of Canaan is then entered into. So that would be 1493 BC. This is 1013 BC. 
And from then, we have 40 years of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. And we have the Exodus in 1533 BC. And from there, we've identified a period of 400 years. That takes us to 1933 BC, and also a period of 430 years, to 1963 BC. This is understood to be when Ishmael mocked Isaac. And this is the beginning of the children of Israel sojourning. And Abraham, or Abram at the time, leaves Haran. To Canaan. And then there's a period of 427 years. To the flood. And that's in 2390 BC. And we have creation in 40, uh, 46 BC. Now, we have in this here period, uh, prior to 1533 BC, do we, well, 1533 BC, do we know the age of Moses? And it is? 80 years old. So Moses is 80 years old. And we can tell then, if we add up, take away, we'd actually add, in a sense, numerically. So that would be 1613 BC. And so can we tell the number of years from when Isaac mocked Ishmael to 1613 BC? 320. Hmm? 320. Okay. And then we can say 360. No, 350 from to there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is 350, and then 427 to 350. Well, that's 777. Yeah, so 350, seven, seven. And seven. So we have a period there to the birth of Moses. Yeah, seven hundred and seventy seven years. <coughs> and we can take this year period here to the temple construction. So if we add eighty, forty, and four hundred and eighty. How, how many years is that? Um, well, 600. Do you want to use, yeah, use your... Yeah, so you're going to have 600 years altogether, 120 okay. plus 480. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the flood, how old was Noah when the flood occurred? 600. Okay. So we can identify a mirror. Yeah. Or, so the birth of Moses. So <clears throat> creation would be further that way. So I'm just writing 600 here. So this would be Noah's age. And there was, a, when did he then 
begin to prophesy concerning the flood, or in a sense prophesy, but begin build the ark as well. 120. So these here, four, 600 years, can be divided into a period of 120 years, and until that their time, we can then identify that Noah was 480 years old when he had that uh, command to build the ark. And therefore, in the other end of this here period of 600 years, we've identified that there is already given to us a period of 480 years. And then if we add up the years of Moses' life, it would be 120. So you have 480, 120, 777, 120, and 480. I just think this is uh, a divine uh, stamp of approval. Now, we had always looked at the 120 and the 480 and the 120 and the 480. I mean, but we didn't have the span of time to give us the 777, mm -hmm. right? That's where, yes. uh, you know, we weren't quite sure about that. At least I knew the 480 and the 120. I know mm -hmm. they had a longer period in there. Um, but it would, took time to get that 777 years. I think when I first looked at it, because I had a different year for creation, because I hadn't worked out some of the details. Um, it was 470 something. I think it was like 400, and, or I think it was 770 years is what I had originally. Mm -hmm. um, but 777's seven, seven, uh, better. And, and of course that's correct, because I, I hadn't worked out some of the chronology early on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just another observation. These here, 427 years. If we add the 30 years to them to 1933 BC, we then have a span of 457 years. And that takes us to 1933 BC. And then this is going to be the flood. And this flood ends the first time prophecy that is brought to view in the Bible, found in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, of the 120 years. Now, if you were to take 1933 as a span as well, From the flood, that will take us to 457 BC. And this is the beginning of the 2300 year prophecy, which will take us to 1844. And this is when we have prophetic time no longer. So in that structure, we have the beginning in the sense of prophetic time, the 120 to the flood, with that first prophecy, and that structure then takes us to 457 BC, um, where we have the beginning of the prophecy that takes us to the end of prophetic time. And if we count back from the date of the flood, to when Moses, or sorry, Noah was 120 years old, sorry, 480 years old, before he begins to build the ark. So we add 120 to this here period. It gives us the number 2510 BC, as when the ark began to be built. And it's just interesting if, we, if you take the date 1844. And we look at the difference between these here uh, two numbers. It's uh, the number 666 as well. So just quite interesting. I'll just share it on the screen again.
So that's that 777 chiasm on the PowerPoint. And that's that uh, structure there with the 666 at the bottom with the two dates of beginning and ending. And we also have uh, sort of similar structures that we can identify. So from when Lamech died, so he dies five years before the flood. So period of five, five, five years there, and so 777, seven, seven, you can identify. So you could have, even have a structure there, 777 seven, seven, with five years, followed by seven hundred, another 777 years um, to the birth of Noah, uh, Moses. Um, but 457 years then from then, will take us to the, the date when Isaac is born. So Abraham, he's 100 years old. When Ishmael mocks Isaac, he's 105. So this is just going five years back, so that will take you to 1938 BC. And uh, this is Lamech, he's 777 here. I don't understand. What's that 777 with the five years there? So, yeah, so this is the, the life of Lamech. So he dies five years before the oh, flood. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. So I'm just identifying these here, 457 years will take us to when, when Isaac is born. Yeah, it's coming up now. And then it's going to be a span of 1938 years. So Isaac was born in 1938 BC. And therefore, we have a span as well, 1938 years to Artaxerxes' decree. And we had 777 years of Lamech's life before he died at the beginning of them 457 years. And then from 457 BC, we have a span of 777 years to the Sunday law of Constantine. And prior to Lamech being born, Methuselah uh, had lived 187 years. And on the other side of that mirror, if he had 187 years beyond the, the, the Sunday law of Constantine, we come to the taking away of the daily in 508, which begins the 1335 year prophecy of Daniel chapter 12, verse 12. And it's also interesting. When you add up all the patriarchs who lived when Isaac was born, including Sarah and uh, Ishmael, it's a, a period of 777 times two. So this is quite a, a similar structure, but all, I also have added beyond Methuselah being born a period of 292 years. And that will take us to when Mahalalil was born. And here, if we add, add 292 years from the taking away of the daily in 508 BC, which we've connected to the 25th of December, uh, when Clovis was baptized, there was a, there is currently, um, a historian by the name of Danuta Shanzar. I think she has some Iranian background, but she lives in America. So she identified 508 AD as the time when Clovis was baptized on the 25th of December. Some other history books will give it as uh, 496, but I tend to favor this here 508 date as being more prophetically significant, and that she's just confirming what uh, prophecy has already uh, given us. But it's interesting if you add, an, add the other end of this here, Mur, the 292 years, it takes us to when Charlemagne 
was crowned Rule, Holy Roman Emperor in 800 AD, and that there also occurred on the 25th of December. And another interesting point is if you take these here periods and add them all together, it gives us the number 2512, which we can take as a symbol of the 25th of December. Now the first verse with Mahalalel in it is Genesis 5.12. Mm -hmm. So that's got all the digits of 2.5.12. Okay, thank you for that interesting. So in this here picture, I'm taking this here history here, and in a sense I'm zooming in to the end of that structure. And uh, just identifying there, from the Sunday law to the daily, being taken away, 187 years. But also to the Charlemagne being crowned Holy Roman Emperor is the, uh, a period from the Sunday law of Constantine, 479 years. And if you add 479 with 187, we have the number 666. And there, there's just some Wikipedia information concerning uh, Clovis uh, being baptized. It actually agrees with Danuta Shanzar. In this year case, uh, there's other websites that will disagree. So the first king of the Franks to unite all the Frankish tribes under one ruler, Clovis was baptized on Christmas Day 508. The adoption of, by Clovis of Catholicism led to widespread conversion among the Frankish peoples to religious unification to Charlemagne's alliance with the Bishop of Rome uh, to the consequent birth of the early Holy Roman Empire. So even there, Wikipedia is identifying Clovis, a connection with Clovis to Charlemagne. And then Wikipedia then says, Charlemagne, on the 25th of December, King of the Franks, is crowned Holy Roman Emperor by Pope Leo III as Charles I. The coronation takes place. So he's, Charlemagne is basically another name, for Charles the Great. So Charles I. The coronation takes place during Mass at the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome on Christmas Day. So um, what time is it now? Have we, how long is that? We've got uh, about seven minutes. Seven minutes. OK. Um, I would like to maybe read about some Ellen White comments rather than progressing. Um, just concerning, and we can focus more on proof for 1533 uh, BC later. Um, Bring it up. Share. So, I 
I'm just going to read some comments concerning wheels and thin wheels. So previously, going back now to Ezekiel chapter 1, I had previously, I think it was in the second presentation, identified that Ezekiel, when he sees these here four creatures, the lion, or the, the angels with the, the heads of a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle, that these relate to the constellations, and God is, in a sense, over these constellations and controlling, controlling them. And later on, then, uh, it talks about wheels within wheels in that chapter. So I'm going to just ask uh, Theodore if you'd like to maybe read. I'm going to just try and make this a bit bigger for you. If I can see it here on my screen. Okay, but I'll make it look. So how much easy. you want me to read? And we'll just read the first paragraph first of all, and then we'll take it from there. The the one dealing with the first and second chapters, or you see it there on the screen, wheels within yeah. wheels. Yeah. So start it with now. Yes. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth, by the living creatures with four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of beryl. And their four had, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. Okay, thank you. So this is from Ezekiel chapter 1. And then, just uh, if you want to read what El might then comments on this. As the wheel-like complications were under the guidance of the hand beneath the wings of the cherubim, so the complicated play of human events is under divine control. Amidst the strife and tumult of nations, he that sitteth above the cherubim still guides the affairs of the earth, the history of nations that one after another have occupied their allotted time and place, unconsciously witnessing to the truth of which they themselves knew not the meaning, speaks to us. To every nation and to every individual of today, God has assigned a place in his great plan. Today, men and nations are being measured by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. All are by their own choice deciding their destiny, and God is overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. Okay, thank you. So we find that word plummet being mentioned in Isaiah, chapter 28, where you have line upon line, and the plummet is measuring righteousness. And we have it there also connected with wheels within wheels. I'll just read, there's a part there you, mentioned, you missed uh, the, the, above that. It says, the first and second chapters of Ezekiel should be carefully studied. The wheels within wheels represented in this symbol was confusion to the finite eye. But a, ha but a hand of infinite wisdom was revealed amid the wheels. Perfect order is brought out of the confusion. Every wheel works in its right place in perfect harmony with, other, with every other part of the machine, machinery. So I think my sort of what comes to my mind when I'm reading this, and I'm seeing these here, structures and time that previously a lot of the history that we read we didn't know how to place things there was a bit of confusion but God is bringing perfect order out of this here confusion with these wheels within wheels we can think of the wheels within wheels to be in like a cog and a timepiece and even to the the earth going around the sun and the moon going around the earth and whatever other planets going around the sun and so forth, that these are, uh, in a sense, wheels within wheels is connected with time. And we're seeing what was confusion 
now being brought into says there perfect harmony and we're with these here structures. I'll, I'll read the bottom quote it says the real like complications that appeared to the prophet to be involved in such confusion were under the guidance of an infinite hand. The Spirit of God revealed to him as moving and directing these wheels brought harmony out of confusion. So the whole world was under his control. Myriads of glorified beings were ready at his word to overall the power and policy of evil men and bring good to his faithful ones. Um, this is occurring when Ezekiel is in the fifth day of the fourth month, on the 21st of July. And this is connecting him to Millerite history. And we're now understanding that Samuel Snow, who was given that, who gave that, or behold the Gregor and cometh on that date in 1844, is connected now to Ezekiel. And this is very, this is not even, not understood in Adventism. And um, we're privileged to, uh, to understand these things. And uh, I believe it's part of God's work that we, we share these things. Um, maybe you could just read this here. Uh, it's quite similar, but. God is acquainted with every man. Could our eyes be opened, we would see that eternal justice is at work in our world. A powerful influence, not under man's control, is working. Man may fancy that he is directing matters, but there are higher than human influences at work. The servants of God know that he is working to counteract Satan's plans. Those who know not God cannot comprehend his movements. There is a work, there is at work, a wheel within a wheel. Apparently, the complication of machinery is so intricate that man can only can see only a complete entanglement. But the divine hand, as seen by the prophet Ezekiel, is placed upon the wheels, and every part moves in complete harmony, each doing its specified work, yet with individual freedom of action. Okay, so Theodore, you've already identified that, in a sense, this movement... Is, uh, is Ezekiel. And uh, initially it's con there's confusion seen when we look at this here, complication of machinery. But with Ezekiel, in a sense, we're now beginning to see these wheels um, moving in complete harmony. We're seeing that all these time structures connect, that there's a, a structure, an order to what God is doing in this here world. And I think it's more than just, of course, you know, the chronology, uh, because this is uh, the place of the individual within God's plan and purpose. And so we're not all the same. And when we look at the unity, the divine unity that God wants to have with his people, it's not because we're all the same. It may look complicated, but God works. His spirit fills us and guides our lives so that his will is worked out. And so mm -hmm. that's why each person is important in God's plan. Yes. And it says there that uh, God is acquainted with every man. And with our own, he's identifying with our own these here time structures as well, which are sort of personal to his life. And but sort of connect with the movement as well, that sort of witness to these things. It's not just maybe the, the group of the movement, but even individuals can have sort of these, this here time structures in order, even within them. It's like a, they're like a wheel within a wheel. Yeah, that's why we, we shouldn't have, you know, think that people, because they find dates and stuff in their life are connected to the lines, that somehow that's mm -hmm. arrogant. Um, we should expect it from all people in the movement that we that God has us in His in His plan in His purpose. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Would you like to just close with prayer? Because I don't want to go into your time. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for each person. And Lord, sometimes it's very difficult to understand your purposes. Why events happen the way they do. Why we meet the people that we do why truths come to us in a particular way. But we know, Lord, that you overrule all events, that all things work together for good, whether it's in our sorrow or in our joy, in our pain or pleasure that we have in knowing you and knowing each other, in our fellowship with one another, that your purposes are being worked out. We submit our lives to you. We ask uh, that you can use us as a part of the body of Christ and that we can minister to one another. We pray for this movement. We pray for uh, the people here in North America, in Africa, around the world, those that are studying these things. And we just pray, Lord, that we uh, can play the part that you have for us and that we can trust your hand. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen.